This is Fred Beck from Fred Talks Fighting. Today, I'm very lucky to be joined by Lou DiBella. So thank you very much for coming on, Lou. It's my pleasure, Fred. So do you have today, Lou? I'll, I woke up at 9.30, had to go to college, so it was 9.30 to 12, so nice. And then I had to go get my eye test. And I see you got glasses there, my mum's glasses. And now I should be able to get glasses. So I was trying all these glasses on you. And then, now I'm going to get a pair like yours. But they have always like the Harry Potter glasses like that. Anyway, what's been going on with you, though, Lou? Excuse me? What's been going on with you? What's happening with you? What's been going on with me? I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, I, I actually, I, I run two minor league baseball teams, the San Francisco Giants double A team in Richmond, Virginia, and the, I'm the managing partner. I don't run them. I have real people that know stuff that run them. Um, but I'm the manager, you know, I'm the managing owner of uh, two baseball teams. So in Richmond, Virginia, we had opening night on uh, Tuesday night. So I was in Virginia Tuesday and Wednesday, a lot of the week, going to baseball games and uh, away from boxing for a few days, which is is healthy, Fred. It's good to get away from boxing for a few days. But I see the boxing glove in the background, and I know that you you set this up to talk boxing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna let you hit me with your first boxing question. <laughs> yeah, I got I got that glove for Christmas, and they get someone to sign it. You know, I think it's an autograph glove. Yeah, I don't know much about baseball, you know, because baseball's not big in the UK. It's more like the football and the boxing, which is kind of big, mainly football over here. But Who do you support in football? I don't, I don't actually follow football. Oh, you don't? So you're, you're only boxing? Yeah, it'd be soccer for you guys in America. Yeah. Eng English people hate the word soccer. Anyway. Mm -hmm. No, no, I was asking you about soccer. When I said, who do you support in football? I didn't mean American football. No, I yeah. meant soccer. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not Fred. I'm not that dumb, my friend. I've been around the I've been around the world a bit. You know what I'm saying? So when I was asking you about football, I was referring to who do you support in the Premier League? I don't. I don't support. So I don't, I don't actually follow football. It's all boxing. So you don't follow football for American football or soccer? No, neither. Oh, no, no wonder you have a boxing show. You're perfect for it. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate that. Um. Yeah. So. You've been involved in boxing a very long time. I'm just starting out. You went, you studied law at Harvard University. So how did you initially get into boxing? You know, I, I never thought about getting into boxing, to tell you the truth, Fred. Like, I, I, since I was a little kid, my two favorite sports were American, you know, baseball and boxing. And my grandparents, were, my grandfathers were Italian immigrants. And they adopted baseball as their... American sport when they came to to America and so when my I would watch TV with my grandfathers and my dad baseball was something that we we watched a lot of so I became a big baseball fan and they love boxing my grandfathers love boxing particularly my grandfathers my, my dad got into it the same way I did it because my grandfather was into it um, and there was an Italian middleweight champion Nino Benvenuti who looked like a movie star um, and he's still like, he still looks like a movie star. He's like 80 something years old and he's a commentator in Italy, but it got me into boxing. I would follow Nino Benvenuti when I was a little kid watching his fights with my father and my grandfather. And then I got introduced to Muhammad Ali when I was a little kid and he was like my hero. And, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali, the you know, I love boxing and I love baseball, but I never thought about working in boxing. I really didn't. Um, but I wanted to be a lawyer. I, I went to law school because I wanted to get into the entertainment and sports industries. And obviously I wasn't a boxer or a player, so I wasn't going to be able to get into them, you know, any other way than using that law degree to find a job in sports or entertainment. So I went to law school. I was lucky enough to get into Harvard, which is a big name and, and helps you get a job. Um, I started at a law firm for a few years, but I spent all those years at the law firm trying to figure out how to get into box, how to get into sports or entertainment. It wasn't how to get into boxing; it was how to get into sports or entertainment. So, in 1989, I was I was 29 years old, and I knew I wanted to leave the law firm, and I needed to get a job right now in sports or entertainment, and there was a job available as the head lawyer for the New York Yankees. And I, I, I interviewed for that job with a bunch of officials at the Yankees. 
uh, we, the Yankees are like the, you know, the Yankees are like the, the Manchester United of uh, baseball. Okay. And um, I interviewed with them and they narrowed it down to three candidates. And I was supposed to go in for an interview along with these other two candidates. The three of us were being interviewed on the same day. And um, that morning I got a phone call saying that the owner of the Yankees thought I was too young. I was still in my twenties that I was too young to be the head lawyer for the Yankees. So they canceled the interview. And the guy's name was George Steinbrenner. He's sort of a legend. And George Steinbrenner's secretary said to me, I feel terrible for you, Lou. It's not your fault you're 29 years old. And, um, but if this helps you at all, the, the guy that I think is going to get the job was also interviewing at HBO Sports as the, you know, to be the lawyer for HBO Sports. So as soon as I heard that, the light went off in my head, boxing, HBO, Hagler Hearns, you know, Seth Abraham, uh, you know, and I, I literally like got off that phone call. I had my suit on to go into see the Yankees. Instead of going to the Bronx to Yankee Stadium, I went to the HBO building to try to see if I could get my name thrown in to be the lawyer for HBO boxing. So um, I went to the HBO building. I snuck past security. I went up to the, to the uh, head lawyer at HBO, a senior, senior executive at HBO. I went to his office and I said, I heard your, you know, I, I went to his secretary. I said, I need to talk to the guy because I heard you're hiring a lawyer for HBO sports and I'm the right guy. And the, the, uh, the secretary went into the assistant, went into, um, you know, the office and, 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 and the guy, the guy was nice enough to see me for a few minutes, but I guess he was so impressed with how much I knew about boxing and how much I love boxing that he sent me up to Seth Abraham's office. And Seth was the president of HBO sports back then. And, and Seth was, you know, obviously was a big boxing guy and a big boxing expert, uh, but he was also a big baseball fan. And he and I sort of hit it off and we talked about boxing and baseball and all sorts of things. And the next thing I knew, I had a job in boxing. Well, in, in legal at a major media company, but a, a job that was boxing related because part of my portfolio was going to be doing the legal work for HBO Sports. And then I started in that capacity and then it went from being the, the lawyer for HBO Sports to being the guy that bought the fights for HBO. So that, that's how that all started. Now, that's quite a story. It's crazy how one turn of events can lead to another and all success. You say you met Muhammad Ali when you were quite young, the same as Mike Tyson. I think when Mike Tyson was a teenager, I met Muhammad Ali. Um, and you're saying you were doing all this law at HBO. But then when did you originally start doing this work on the documentaries you were making for them? I, I, did, I did some legal work for the documentaries in HBO Sports when I was a lawyer there. When I got into the department, there were a couple of documentaries I was involved with, but that was really the area that was more under a guy named Ross Greenberg, who was a pretty famous like executive producer and director of, of, of documentaries and sports films. But, you know, I got the bug for sports documentaries when I was at, at HBO. And when I left HBO, I started producing documentaries and, and getting involved. I, I have a little production company and I've done a bunch of projects and you know, boxing related documentaries that I've been executive producer or producer of and, and, uh, and that's just something I like to do on the side because uh, I like film, you know? So the, I, I, one, one of my favorites, you probably, I don't know if you've seen any of the documentaries, but um, 50 Cent and I co-produced a documentary about Johnny Tapia called Tapia. Um, you can get to, you could watch Tapia if you have HBO on demand, or you could probably get a copy. You could probably like find a way, you're a 16 year old kid. I'm sure you could find a way to watch it. It's probably out there somewhere in the, uh, the internet world. Um, I also did a documentary um, that I, I was one of the executive producers of on Sergio Martinez called Maravilla. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was produced by a great, a great young filmmaker from, uh, you know, from Argentina, uh, where Sergio is originally from. And, and it's really an interesting documentary about the business of boxing. I did a, ma a documentary on Paulie Malinaji called Magic Man. Um, I've done a, bu a, bunch of, a bunch of film stuff. A lot of it's been in boxing. I'm trying to do projects now that are, 
you know, sort of go into other areas other than boxing. But, but I, I find myself continuing to get involved in boxing projects. I wonder why. I don't know. You know. I mean, when we used to read a boxing documentary, nothing kind of more sticks out than the 24-7 series HBO always used to produce. And that's one thing that kind of boxing lacks nowadays is kind of some of the promotional sides, some of the documentaries that can really... Because remember, for the, I'll use an example of Mayweather De La Hoya, the 24-7 series. That, that got, you want to really attract as many casual viewers as you can as possible. I remember loads of casual viewers are tuning in. No, that- there's, not enough, there's not enough casual viewers now in general in boxing. There are more casual viewers in the UK. Boxing's way bigger in the UK. Yeah, there yeah, are yeah. no 16-year-old American kids, none, calling me to do Zoom interviews to put on fucking YouTube. Oh, excuse my French, I'm sorry. Yeah, but yeah, you're yeah, the only yeah. 16-year-old kid calling me to do a YouTube video. Um, that's one of the areas we're lacking at in boxing. Boxers have amazing stories. We need to tell them. Whether you tell them in a documentary, you tell them as part of a broadcast of a boxing show. But we need to create more fighters that people care about. And if we created more fighters that people care about by telling their stories, it wouldn't be so easy for internet influencers to become boxing stars. And we'll move on to that in a bit. Um, I think one of the reasons um, boxing is bigger in the UK is because, you know, UFC, UFC is pretty big in America now, but they don't come much into the UK and they only come like once a year and that's March into the UK. They don't come in a while. In the UK, supporters, they really do get behind their fighters. Do you feel that now the UFC, do you, what do you think is bigger in America, the UFC or boxing? Now? Oh, it's not. I mean, it's, it's not close. I mean, I'm, if you're talking about the traditional sport of boxing, yeah. I mean, you can do, you can do growing, exhibitions and freak shows. You can do seniors tours. I mean, Mike Tyson's a superstar, period. And he's, you know, Mike Tyson's a, 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 one of the most known people on the planet. And, but Mike Tyson's not an active fighter anymore. But Mike Tyson could fight Evander Holyfield in an exhibition, and they're both in their 50s, and it's bigger than any real boxing event that we can do in America. You know, um, real boxing, you know, traditional boxing, you know, the best young fighters fighting the best young fighters. First of all, we don't make enough of the fights where the best young fighters do fight the best young fighters. So the quality of our product isn't as competitive as the quality of the UFC's product. The UFC makes competitive product. And there is no comparison at the moment between how popular UFC is with uh, compared to boxing, particularly with people your age up to 30 years old. There, there's no question that UFC is much more popular with young people um, than boxing is. And I would argue that UFC's popularity is more on the rise and, and boxing is getting attention, but it's not like it's not getting Ramirez is anymore. fighting Josh. Right. Ramirez is fighting Josh Taylor. I love that fight. Josh Taylor is a terrific fighter. Uh, Ramirez is a terrific fighter. They're two of the three best guys in their division and they're going to fight each other in a unification of all the belts that should be an immense fight. But more attention is going to Mayweather versus Logan Paul and Jake Paul um, and Holyfield Tyson and Jake Paul against Ben Askram, uh, you know, then is going to Josh Taylor against Ramirez. And, you know, Josh Taylor against Ramirez is, is on ESPN. It's not a pay-per-view fight. It's a great fight. Um, it should get a big audience, and I'm sure it will get a big audience, but nobody's really talking about it. And Jake Paul pulls off Floyd Mayweather's glasses, you know, in a, yeah, in a you know, at a press conference. Oh, he took his hat. I'm sorry. He took his cap. I'm getting confused because uh, Jake Paul did a video we had the glasses on, but no, you're right. He, he, uh, he said, got your cap, right? He got your cap. But he took now his he's raised the merch on um, his cap, but, saying got your cap. He's smart. He's very smart, you know? Now, that video is everywhere. Like, 
you can't turn around and not see that video. I turned on the TV in my office to TM and TMZ is showing that video and sports center is showing that video and everyone is showing that video. I mean, it's a little bit of genius there, but it all, you know, the press conference for, for these exhibitions will get attention. The press conference for Ramirez and Josh Taylor won't. We have to do better. Like when we, we have to deliver more great fights like Ramirez and Josh Taylor. We have to tell the stories of Ramirez and Josh Taylor. You know, we have to get, have our fighters engage their fans more on social media and through media platforms like, you know, TikTok and, and, and Triller and, you know, so these, these new forms of media, YouTube channels. I mean, our, our fighters have to create fan bases. We have to help them create fan bases. We have to tell their stories and we have to make the best fights. And if we don't do all those things, we're going to continue to sort of lag in the background a little bit. I see what you mean. I mean, I think Fight TV, which isn't very big at all, that, it's not that big at the moment anyway, is broadcasting Ramirez and Josh Taylor. And Sky Sports and BT are the two biggest broadcasters, sports broadcasters in the UK. And neither of them have picked the fight up. And he said, Okay, but I'll give it, hold on. Right now, Sky TV should call Bob Arum. They, I mean, their deal with Eddie is over. Go get Josh Taylor against, if, if those rights are available. I mean, I don't know if ESPN is, ESPN's not in, there's no ESPN in the UK, right? So I would think that Sky is free. That's a fight that's good enough that I would think fans, if they're not going to get Eddie's product on Sky, I think fans would love to see Josh Taylor against, against Gilberto Ramirez. And that's the kind of fight that I would think when Eddie's contract is over, fights like that, I hope that Sky will go out and get those fights. You know, I have I have some young talent. You know, and, and I I'd, look, I would I'd sign some more British and Irish fighters myself if Sky was going to open themselves up to you know great boxing when Eddie's contract's over. You know, I have a kid from Ireland named Joe Ward that I would love to fight on Sky, and I know I know Sky is in Ireland. You know, so. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that that Sky Sports stays in the boxing business and tries to make the best fights it can with all the different promoters around the world who are free to do business with Sky. Yeah, I was going to move on to the Sky thing in just a sec. Just a thing on you were saying about the storytelling and trying to get behind the fighters. Jose a great story of like growing up in Argentina, all, the, all that kind of struggle. But if we move on to the Sky Sports situation or the split between matching boxing, if you're in Eddie's Eddie Earn's shoes, would you leave Sky? I mean, he's he's had a good partnership with the Zone, and they've the Zone's really helped build his company um, much bigger than in, and, and had a bigger stable than they've ever had. Um, I don't think it's any surprise because he he heavily went into business with the Zone. It was pretty well known in the boxing business that his deal with Sky was coming to an end. And the zone is a global app. You know, the zone is right now needs to build its following in the UK, in Europe, around the world. So I think it's probably, it makes sense. It makes sense that Eddie did that deal. I think it was inevitable. And um, I, I think that, uh, that the zone is, is certainly growing around the world and in Europe and in the UK. And, uh, it's deal with matchroom should help them grow in, in England. Right. So, um, you know, I, it makes sense to me why they did the deal. And, uh, and I think that uh, Eddie's been working as a part in partnership with the zone for a number of years now. So I just think this move is sort of inevitable. I mean, the zone's an app There's kind of be like soon. It might be like the Netflix of boxing um, in the zone over here. It's only two pounds a month or one ninety nine a month. And that's so cheap. And then Sky Sports, you have to pay your membership, and then you have to buy a pay per view. Pay per view is gonna be like twenty pounds. And the membership is risk like thirty quid a month. So and then the Zone comes along, the Zone UK, and it's two pounds a month. But no one's gonna go join the Zone. So it makes the most sense. Um, so there's a massive fight this weekend: Billy Joe Saunders, Canelo Alvarez. 
I want to get your your thoughts on the on the fight in general. What are your thoughts on the fight? And do you think Billy can get even if he does enough? Do you think he can get the decision on Cinco de Mayo weekend? Um, I don't think I don't think he's going to do enough to get a decision on on Cinco de Mayo weekend. Um, I, I other than speed of foot, I don't see any area in which he's better than Canelo. I think he's a little quicker on his feet. But Canelo's moves very well. Um, I expect Canelo to win. I think if Billy Joe wins, he clearly, I think if Billy Joe can make can frustrate Canelo and make him look silly, um, I do think he could get a decision on, even on Cinco de Mayo weekend. I mean, it's not the easiest thing to get a decision against a superstar. But if you clearly beat them in most people's minds, you have a decent chance of getting that decision. I, I don't see... Canelo losing to Billy Joe. I just don't. I think Billy Joe's a very skilled boxer and has a very difficult style to beat. I don't think I don't think he's going to lose um, badly or in a manner that that you know doesn't speak highly of him. Um, I, I think he's good enough to make it a fight. But I think Canelo's the best fighter in the world till proven otherwise. And I don't expect them to lose to Billy Joe. I'm predicting Canelo by late stoppage or clear decision. I think a lot of people have predicted late stoppage. I find quite, quite kind of odd in a way because how tricky and slippy Billy is. Um, I think Canelo, as he said, but this fight's more a difficult fight than a hard fight. I would say like a Golovkin is more of a hard fight, kind of a slugfest. And Billy's going to be like kind of tricky Tricky Southpaw. I mean, I think that quote from Canelo was so smart. That's a really smart quote. You know, it's more of a tricky fight than a, than a, a, a what do you say, a hard fight? What, what more of a you difficult it's fight? A difficult fight than a hard fight. Than a hard fight. It's more of a difficult, it's exactly what it is. It's a very difficult style to beat. He's a very good boxer. He gives, he has, he has a lot of speed of foot. He can, he can give you angles. He can move away from you. He, you know, he's very slippery. Very awkward, but skilled, right? So that's difficult to beat. But he's not going to engage you in a trench war or beat the shit out of you. Now, that being said, he beat the shit out of David Lemieux. But David Lemieux is not Canelo Alvarez. So I, I think that Billy Joe can present problems, present a difficult style. I think he might be able to make it a fight, take some rounds. I don't see a path to victory. I see a path to a solid performance and a good defeat. But maybe I'm wrong. And you know what? If Billy Joe can manage to confound him, and if boxing fans are watching, believing Billy Joe is winning the rounds, I, I think he has a chance to take a decision. But I, I, I think Canelo's too good, man. Canelo's too good. The body work is too strong. He's, uh, he can punch... Uh, to the body, to the head with both hands. Um, there's not an area of real weakness with Canelo. I mean, there are areas that he doesn't, ex you know, foot speed's not his biggest forte, but his foot, his footwork's still not bad. Everything else about him is top shelf. Um, I, I don't see him lose. And by the way, if, if you press me on it and you said, who has more character between the two guys? I mean, I've seen Billy Joe show up in the ring not looking like himself. You know, Canelo doesn't have a lot of nights where you don't see Canelo. Billy Joe is up and down. Um, I, I'm gonna, I mean, I can't see any reason to pick against Canelo Alvarez. Yeah, I can see your point there. I mean, I think there's a clear level of difference between opposition that Billy's faced and the Canelo's face. I mean, what's Canelo? You fought Prime Jacobs a few fights ago and stopped Kovalev. Cameron Smith was Ring Magazine champion, dom dominated Cameron Smith. Um, do you think there's anyone in the world right now who can beat Canelo? Not at 160 or 168. Not at 154 to 168. No. You don't think Now, you say can. That's the beauty of boxing. Strange things happen. But is there a fighter between 60, 54 and 68 that I say... I'd say to myself, oh, Canelo's afraid of that guy or would duck that guy or I'd make that guy a favorite or 
I'd make that guy super close underdog. No, between 54 and 68, I don't. I, I even would make probably favor Canelo against Perturbiev. But I, I mean, I don't, I mean, the fight doesn't intrigue me that much because I don't care that much about Perturbiev. And I also like Canelo at this weight. I like watching the best fighter in the world fight at the best weight. Now, somewhere when he runs out of opponents at 60 and 68, you know, could a bigger man, if, if Canelo is going to, going to try guys above 68, go into 75 and, or, or higher in the future? I, think, I don't think Canelo is that big a guy. I think 68 is his prime perfect place. You know, but right now I don't see anybody that I would immediately say that guy beats Canelo. No, I always listen to the Steve Barnes and Michael Costello podcast on BBC, and I, it's Canelo said on that he wants to fight for another seven years, and you never know someone else might come yeah, yeah, yeah. on and beat him because seven years is a very long time. How many fights? If he's doing fighting three times a year, that's twenty-one more fights, isn't it? So you never know. And that's what's so good about he, he, even if he only fights another five years there are plenty of guys we've never heard of now that are going to emerge as threats or perceived threats to Canelo. So, you know, yes, there, there will always be people to fight. I have to jump in a minute, but yeah, you yeah. want a last question? Yeah. Um, you're in the new ES, ES, um, eSports Boxing Club game as a promoter. Well, that's great, isn't it? How did you get into that? Um, I, I was lucky enough to get contacted and, and to be in the game. Um, I'm very excited about the game. Look, I used to, I didn't play a lot of video games. I was never a crazy video game kid or, or adult. Um, but the boxing, I mean, I'm, I'm in boxing and boxing lends itself to video games. It's like, just, it's, a, you know, I'm going to play. And, and box, I mean, there are a lot of people that don't know who, who the welterweight champion is, who would love to play a video game you know, uh, on boxing with the best fighters in the world and the best historical fighters and Hall of Fame fighters. And, and you know, I think that the game's going to do really well. Are you excited about the game? Yeah, yeah, I'm really, it's going to be good. I think it's going to give boxing a lot of exposure than it really needs, you know. I agree with that. I think it's only good for boxing. Exactly. I mean, another boxing game in the last 10 years. So it's going to be great. All right, Leo, don't take too much of your time, but thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And where can people find you on social media at? Um, I'm at Lou DeBella on Twitter. Um, DeBella Entertainment has a Facebook page. Uh, DeBella Entertainment also has an Instagram page, but uh, it's at, I think, at DeBella Entertainment. Um, and that's where you can find our social media. All right, Lou, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.